Hey guys, it's Ashley, and this is my Kingdom of Ash reading vlog. So I just got back from seeing Bohemian Rhapsody in theaters, and it was amazing. But I'm coming home to an even greater, or equally great, I guess you would say, amazing thing, and that is this beast right here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started on this thing, because earlier today I was filming a bunch of videos, and this was sitting on my dresser, and so I went and picked it up and I opened it up to the first page and I read the first few lines. I told myself that I wasn't going to read this until I made my Tower of Dawn book talk because I tend to read the sequels and then kind of forget what happened in the first book versus the sequel and then when I make a book talk I'm scared I'm gonna spoil everybody. And I haven't made Tower of Dawn but I really want to read this book so bad so it's happening. I'm just giving in. I'm sorry but I'm not sorry and it's, it's gonna be a thing so we're just gonna start reading it and we're we're gonna see what happens. All right, so it is currently almost about 10 a.m. on the next day. Hello. I stayed up reading Kingdom of Ash until like two in the morning last night, even though I told myself I was gonna go to bed at midnight, but that did not happen, so here we are. So much has happened in this book that I am like, I don't even know what to think right now because we just keep switching between so many point of views. Oh my God, it's like so suspenseful. I just wanna know what's gonna happen. So far, we've got like, Aelin is locked up and Karen is punishing her and Fenris's brother just stabbed himself. I don't know what that was about. Was that supposed to be punishment for Fenris? I don't, I, okay. Also poor Fenris. <laughs> then you have Rowan and Gabriel and Lorcan and Elide coming after her, but they're going in the wrong direction and Elide wants to go in the right direction, but they don't know that they're going in the wrong direction. And Aelin doesn't think that Rowan's coming for her anymore because she's listening to Maeve for some reason, because God forbid Bid Maeve hasn't tricked you your entire life and you're just gonna listen to her as soon as she says that Rowan's not coming for you. We also have Avian and Ren having conversations and a relationship and Ren is actually nice. I like, what is this? Also, Kale and Irene, Kale and Irene, Irene is pregnant. What is happening? What is happening? What, what is, what? And Dorian is now thinking that he's gonna sacrifice himself rather than Aelin sacrificing her own life and it's just like, I don't, I, mm, so much is happening and I don't know how to feel right now. I'm not even on page 100 yet and I, I like, mm, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm not ready for this, I'm not. So anyway, I am going to a coffee shop with my sister and hanging out with her for the day until she goes to work and then when I get back, I will probably edit a video and then continue to to read, so oh, I'm so excited. I'm burning through the sky, yeah. 200 degrees, that's why they call me Mr. Fahrenheit. Oh my god, you guys. I am freaking the actual, excuse my language, f out. I am like, literally, I'm shaking. I'm on page 106, and I, oh. I said in my Empire of Storms book talk that I was expecting people, more people, from the assassin's blade to come back but i hadn't expected nox nox throne of glass from the first book from the competition from the king's competition oh my god i thought he died did we think that he died were we supposed to think that he died or am i just missing something i can't i am totally speechless i can't oh my god okay okay that's um, this is such a small, tiny thing, but it's just bringing me back all the way to when I read Throne of Glass. To when I first read Throne of Glass and I loved Nox. God. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's all I wanted to say. So it's like a little, little bit later. I am currently at the part where Dorian and Manon and the 13 have found a clan of Kroken witches and we just met Manon's great grandmother? Anyways, but beyond this moment, there was also the scene that I read previously with Aelin almost punching her way out of the iron coffin, which was insane. And then Rowan felt that power and immediately was drawn to the north. So now they're on their way to go get Aelin for real this time. And I'm so excited because I'm so done reading sad Aelin chapters. I want happy, powerful, strong Aelin chapters. Should be fun. Hey guys, so it is the morning. I was probably up until 2.30 last night reading because I got to 
one of the best parts of the book I'm sure and I oh I have so much to talk about first I want to talk about Dorian and Manon they found the Crokins and Dorian is trying to figure out how to shapeshift and I'm quite scared of this I don't really like Dorian right now and that's so hard for me to say because I've left him for quite a while So it's so hard for me to say that I'm not like crazy about him or his chapters right now But that's just how it is. I'm sure that it's gonna get better later But yeah, so he's trying to shift and I'm just gonna leave him to it Let him do what he wants to do and we'll see what happens The one thing that I really wanted to talk about was the Rowan Aelin chapters I just got to the part where they free Aelin and I'm still like in shock about what happened i'm like oh my god first off i want to say that elide is a total badass and i take back anything that i said about wondering how she's going to keep up in this group of fey males because she totally totally kicks the ass and they could not have done this without her now second when i was reading the part where aelin runs to larkin and then rowan comes back to him aelin is just screaming screaming for somebody to take the iron off and they can't and rowan is panicking oh my god i can't imagine having that so close and then not being able to take off the chain still so fenris breaks the blood oath to Maeve willingly and is about to die and i knew i knew that aelin was going to offer him the blood oath i knew it and when that happened and when everybody was so shocked about it i was like oh, my heart that was breaking came back together and it was great. Fenris went from being this character that was totally and completely in the background in Era of Fire to this like uh, this lovable man and I'm so here for it. Also that part where Nox was talking to Lysandra as she was Aelin, he was like, so Erewhon knows you're not Aelin. Lysandra's like, what? And he goes, tell me that you remember me then. And I'm like, <laughs> God, I don't want anybody to die. Nobody needs to die, but I know that it's the last book and people are gonna die and I don't want anybody to die. All right, guys, ignore my crazy hair. I just got out of the shower, but it's been quite a while since I've updated you. So I felt this was a good time before I got back into where I was at. So I'm currently on page 415, which is quite a bit more than I had been when I last spoke. So basically, I started reading on my break and uh, I got to a point. You know when you're reading a good fantasy book and like an Empire of Storms, you had your group of people and then at the very end they kind of all like diverged and went in different directions to do different things and then when they finally meet back up, it's like this big huge moment and you're just like so giddy and like so like crazy happy that is where i ended on my break and i had to work another four hours knowing that when i got back to this book i was going to just be reading such a great scene and i was missing out on it for four hours because i had to help customers get a fitting room but i'm back now and i'm able to read and i'm so excited so basically i left off on the point where Aelin and Rowan and Lorcan and Gabriel and Elide have met up with Kale and Nezrin and Irene and Sartak and Hussar at Aniel and Aniel is being sacked. This scene is so, so great because Falcon and Bort are just about to be introduced and it's gonna be so great. But I gotta get back to what had previously happened. First order of business, Irene, she is definitely 100% pregnant. Kale knows about it now. Out of all of the characters in this book, Kale and Irene are the most like sane, normal couple out of anybody. Like they got married as normal, their relationship was normal, you know, they're having a kid. Like sure, they're in the middle of this war, but they weren't separated by torture or, you know, having like really hot and crazy sex with a witch. They were just two normal human beings just doing normal human being stuff and they're just the most sane couple in this entire situation at this point. But she's definitely pregnant and I'm so scared for what that means. I don't I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know. But the other thing I wanted to mention was Lorcan and Elide. So something's obviously happening. And even though Elide was really pissed at him in the beginning, she's slowly coming around right after Aelin offered Lorcan the blood oath. So Aelin offered Lorcan the blood oath because she couldn't trust his loyalties and he ended up taking it. She's getting 
all of the cadre on her side and I'm just like so overwhelmed with emotion right now because in just like one book ago they were all sworn to Maeve. That one moment that I read that Lorcan was like you know Maeve's blood oath had come with so many different contingencies and things told in the old language and Aelin's literal only order was you will protect Terrasen and you can do whatever you want after that. You just gotta respect her for that. The only other thing that I really read was Dorian and Manon, but nothing's really happened there because Dorian is still trying to figure out how to shift. I don't really know what exactly is happening and I'm really scared for Dorian to go and try to get the third key. Like this is like really frightening me. Oh, Manon is starting to care more. Which is which is good. I like seeing that side of her. Oh, Dorian's conversation with Caltaine. I was not expecting her to come back like that. Like he tried to call on Gavin again, and instead she he got Caltaine. And I just looked at it and I was like, literally, every person who was ever in any Throne of Glass book whatsoever is coming back in this book. Literally everybody. Oh, the one thing that really like I I did not like because it was just so sad was the part where. You know, he's trying to figure out how to shift and they keep saying like, well, you, what, what do you wish that you are? Like, wh who do you wish you would be? And he just said, you know, someone better, someone worthy of my friends, somebody worthy of this position that I'm in. And it just like tore me apart. Oh, the only other thing, um, Adian and Lysandra, they're, they're chapters. The part that I'm at right now with them is that um, the, the war is happening and they just drowned a bunch of people in the river and the witches just brought the witch mirror tower and the one witch gave over to the yielding and Adian is like crying for Lysandra because she just shifted into Aelin to get the rally the troops again and all of this is happening and I don't know if they're gonna live or die and I swear to god if anything happens to Adian or Lysandra I am going to hate Sarah J Mass for the rest of my life. Like, this book is like so freaking crazy. Like, <sighs> okay, update. Not only has Manon already just killed, killed the, the yellow legs matron, um, Aelin has apparently been burrowing into her power for three months and I'm just like, mm. Things are just not gonna go well. I can feel it. I can feel it. Also, Lorcan is, um, he's almost dead. And, um, then God lied, came to her senses, and decided that she was going to go save him. Because I really, really, really like their love story. Their love story is, like, keeping me alive at this point. This is how I've been. I just, I don't know how to, I don't know how to feel. I don't know how to feel. I am uh, back to a Crokin chapter after I just finished um, a chapter of Aelin destroying a tidal wave. Didn't know that was possible. So I realized that I'm wearing the same shirt and my hair is wet and I'm in the same exact place I was before, but um, I swear this is the next night this i literally i've only had time to read at night and i just so happened to put on the same shirt because it really wasn't dirty and i just i this is a different night <laughs> anyways i'm kind of like freaking out right now and i felt like i should say something before i move on to the next part of this book because i am so so scared right now if i thought i was scared when i thought lorcan was gonna die and Elide was going to die that is nothing compared to the fear that i have now that dorian has been caught by Maeve in the morath stronghold i am so petrified right now it says Dorian lunged for the gap between the door and the floor, but her black-footed boots slammed down upon his tail. The Fae Queen smiled down at him. You are not a very skilled spy, King of Adarlan. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my god, I'm so scared. Never wanted happy things more in my life than I have now reading this story. This story is giving me such anxiety, and I don't want to keep reading, but I have to keep reading. So, um, we're gonna find out what happens. Okay, I'm confused and slightly horrified and also kind of disgusted. So Dorian is, is gonna marry Maeve? And now there's a scene where Dorian is talking to Erewhon? What, what is, what is Dorian doing? Does he know what he's doing? Excuse my language, but holy shit. What I've learned from chapter 78 is that Dorian is, he's, he's not a puppy. And you see, he's not a man. He's, some, he's something else. I don't even know anymore. His raw magic is so powerful that he can not only shapeshift, he can ensnare Maeve's mind and then rip a part of her 
from her what the actual hell is happening so many strange things i don't i can't i'm oh my god i'm on page 663 out of like 990 something but he has all three weird keys which is good we have rolf and the mycenians who just uh saved Terrason's asses and but now they're about to be killed by a hundred thousand you know legions of morath soldiers but it's fine we have aelin and kale and all of their gang going to the Farian gap to get through to go to Terrasen, and we also have the Krokens gathered by Maeve going to Terrasen. so like everybody's on their way to Terrasen right now and all of this shit is about to go down in the last like 250 pages and I don't know if I'm ready for that okay so because I'm totally stupid and honestly just trying to stall before I get to the end because I'm seriously this scared about this story I am at the part right now where Elide is talking to Vernon because they have captured Vernon in the fairy and gas I stopped in the middle of this really good scene because of this single sentence Lorcan growled <laughs> I have read so many parts of this book where guys and men have growled and the females have growled and I'm just standing here or not I'm I'm laying I'm laying here but I'm just laying here like what what does that sound like okay also ignore this towel under me my hair is wet and I just realized that it looks really weird to have this here but whatever has Sarah J Mass ever heard a man growl <laughs> does she have a specific sound in mind when she's writing this sentence. This really, really, like, suspenseful, tense room. Since my breaths are limited, I suppose it makes no difference what I tell you. Because I could. And then all of a sudden, from his right, you hear this, like, Urgh. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm gonna go back to this scene. I just started... This is not a funny scene, but I'm dying. Oh my god, 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 oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, I really haven't gotten anywhere, like, super great. Oh, a pillow just fell on the floor and it scared the crap out of me. I was sure that Adian and Lysandra and Evangeline were about to die, and then Manon and the Krokens came, and it was beautiful and amazing, and I almost cried, and Evangeline wants to be a Kroken witch now, and I'm just like, oh, it's too much. And then, and then what got me like so, so freaking excited, Dorian was talking to Gavin, and then saw the Iron Teeth Legion heading to Orinth above him, and he turned into a wyvern, and then followed them. I, I cannot wait to see what everybody thinks of how he's like changed in the few months that he's been like by himself Like he can shift now. He can do crazy things. He's super powerful. He has all three weird keys I'm so excited <laughs> I can't I can't I can't breathe I can't breathe I don't I don't even want to read that I don't even want to read that chapter again I don't want to I don't want to go through it again. I don't- That was so awful. Oh my god. I'm talking about what happens on pages 750 and 751 if anybody is wondering. I didn't think that the death of the 13th would bother me this much and would cause this kind of reaction but I cannot read that chapter again. I mean this is what I've been preparing for this entire time, right? I should be ready for this. But then it comes and the chapter was written so, so horribly. I can't breathe and I'm staring at the next chapter because I don't want to go back to the previous chapter and read what I just read because I know I'm gonna start breaking down again even though I haven't really stopped. The thing that I can't get over more than anything was that Asterion, like the other 13, it was it was sad and it was heartbreaking the way that it was written, but Asterion, I don't want to think about it anymore. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going and hopefully I'll forget about it later on, but I probably won't. Okay, now that I've kind of calmed down, I can talk some more about where I'm at in this book. I turned to my trusty throne of glass partner, Ashley, from Ashley Outpaged, um, to guide me through this climactic time because I am currently in the middle of the chapters where Aelin and Dorian attempt to close the gates and 
there is some stuff I want to talk about. Not only are they trying to close the gate and they about do that, they realize that it's going to take both of their lives, which first of all, that was not what we bargained for. They said it needed one life. So you would think when two people with the same amount of power to seal it on their own, did it together, it would only take half of their power. But no, everything is up and nothing makes sense in this world so anyway not only that but dorian's dad came around and he was like hey i'll finish it for you and they were like okay and then of course aelin was like well i still have to give my life so she kind of kicked dorian out then all of this stuff is happening with the gods mala ends up helping her and she ends up going home that's the part that i'm at now two things i want to mention <laughs> first it is so hard so hard to stay within the mindset of this climactic, suspenseful, tension-ridden time when Sarah J. Mass says the word Colonel three times within two pages of this scene. Ahem. <clears throat> Aelin took the Colonel of Power from her palm, page 795. They would not get to take this, this most essential Colonel of self, of soul. Every single time I hear the word Colonel, I think popcorn and I cannot be thinking of popcorn while I'm reading this chapter. They just don't go together. Also, did Reese just help Ayla get back to her world? I'm so confused. Did Sarah J Mass literally just reference her own series i cannot i um i texted ashley about this because at this point i was just like flat out like this this is not happening what what the actual hell um and she did say that somewhere along the line sarah j mass had referenced or said sometime that they are connected kind of like a multiverse which i guess makes sense because she's seeing all of these different worlds pass by and they kind of reference you know our world with the tall glittering skyscrapers and everything and so it would make sense that like they, she would see other worlds like i don't know Reese and Feyre's. but just like the way that she describes it i'm just gonna like i'm just gonna read this and and we'll we'll, we'll see she passed through a world of snow-capped mountains under shining stars my first hint that this is this is Akatar. passed over one of those mountains where a winged male stood beside a heavily pregnant female gazing at those very stars. Fae. They were Fae. They were not of her world. She flung out a hand as if she might signal them, as if they might somehow help her when nothing was but an invisible speck of power. The winged male. Beautiful beyond reason. Aelin does not need to be thinking about this as she is dropping through worlds. Snapped his head toward her as she arced across his starry sky. Literally, the single part in this in this scene sounds like a sex scene. It, this is this is how Sarah J. Mass writes her sex scenes. He lifted a hand as if in greeting. A blast of dark power like a gentle summer night slammed into her not to attack but to slow her down. A wall, a shield that she tore and plunged through but it slowed her. The winged male's power slowed her just enough. Aelin vanished from his world without a whisper. I cannot. I I can't. I'm dead. I can't. I don't like that at all. It really like I really don't like that reference, but I understand why she did it. It makes sense, but it doesn't mean that I have to like it. Also, the gods the gods didn't take Erewhon. So like what was the whole the whole point of this that we've learned so far is that the gods are assholes. And I feel like that is a common theme within a lot, a lot of books. It makes me question why. I'm gonna close the door for this because I have a lot that I want to say and it's, it's, it's gonna take a while. I just finished Kingdom of Ash. That was such, such a good ending. I'll talk about the parts that started making me cry later, but um, first I want to get into a lot of the stuff that I kind of stopped talking about after a while because the story just picked up and I just wanted to know what was gonna happen. I don't even remember when the last time that I spoke to you guys was. I left off, I want to say I left off around when the 13 died. That part broke me more than anything else in this entire story. Like, yes, the moment where, you know, Aelin and Dorian were sealing the weird gate, that was scary, and I was afraid that everybody was going to die, but the moment when the 13 died, I don't, I don't even want to, like, think about that again, so we're gonna move on past that. I also can't sit like this and lay like this, so we're gonna move! Ooh, before we get into, like, my feelings on the end of the book, let's talk about more Sarah J Mass um, little quotes that really bother me throughout the entire series that every time I see, I can't help but like 
hate and pinpoint. Eyes lined with silver to say that somebody's crying. That really, really aggravates me because tears are not silver. But I mean, I guess in the light they shine, which kind of makes them look silver, but I just, I don't get that. Oh, Lorcan growling, <laughs> that was another one. When somebody's angry and the, per the author describes it as somebody's nostrils flaring, like I get that people's nostrils flare when they're angry and that that's kind of like a um is it synecdoche where like a part equals the whole or a part represents the whole like a part of anger that you see on somebody's face represents anger itself but i just hate that part of anger to represent anger like his nostrils flared oh the last one that really really bothered me more than anything and i'm only saying this because so many people make fun of the way that Sarah J Maas writes her sex scenes because of some of the weird language that she uses, um, i.e. velvet wrapped steel. I like to point out some of the other things because I feel like authors tend to find ways to say things and then will continue to say that same exact thing because it's just what they've gotten used to. And I think this is what happens with Sarah J Maas more than anybody else that I've ever read because there are so many of these lines scattered throughout this book that I just noticed constantly over and over again. The one that really bothers me the most is when somebody says something softly but not weakly. I really hate that she needs to point out that they didn't say something weakly even though it was soft. Allied more so than anybody else would say something softly but not weakly. It's like we know that Allied is strong, we know that whatever she's saying is, you know, not weak. So I hate that saying and now that we all know that we're just gonna move on. I'm just gonna talk about the battle and like my feelings about it. The first thing that I remember is um, Orinth being crushed by Morath and uh, the new aerial legion of Iron Teeth witches, the thousand more just came in and they had basically lost all hope and then Aelin and Rowan and Lorcan and the Kagan army and literally everybody just swarms in. And of course Aelin is riding on the Lord of the North He's got the eternal flame between his antlers. It's a crazy time. Ah, uh, it was better than anything ever, ever, ever. <laughs> Just to see Aelin as somebody who had gone from being who she was at the beginning of this book, an assassin who just had nothing to live for really, who really didn't care if she lived or died, to marching onto a battlefield with magic and Bay warriors at her side on the Lord of the North ah, in the country that she belongs to that is hers it's just so unreal so they march onto the battlefield Aelin does not have her power anymore which is something else that I was kind of struggling to understand with because like why did they have to seal the doors right then wouldn't it have helped I mean I know that they were hoping that the gods would take Erewhon with them like they promised that they would but I'm just like it would have made more sense to just wait until the battle when she had all of that power I thought that it meant a lot more by the end that she didn't have that power Kale and Irene Irene holy shit <laughs> Kale first of all you know he's had some amazing things happen to him in the last book like I'm not gonna lie about that but Irene not only does she have this power not only is she healing all of these soldiers but she killed Erewhon while pregnant and then by the end she tells Hafiza that she wants to build a Torre Sesme in the north and Kale's mom and brother are going to come and live with them and it's gonna be so so great and I'm so happy for them oh my god but Maeve is the one who I'm really like concerned about because Maeve was battling off with Aelin Aelin does not have an ounce of power left in her and she's swarming Rowan and Lorcan and Fenris and that's the part that I stopped at before I went to work today and literally all day today all I could think about was that last sentence of that chapter. Uh, Rowan started screaming. Rowan was seeing Aelin, you know, dead and staked on the gates of Orinth and Lorcan was seeing Elide telling him that he was worthless and, and that moment where he was like, I think you might be my mate. I was like, oh my god. And then that moment at the end where Lorcan was willing to give up his eternal and immortal life to live a mortal life with Elide, I like, I lost it. I literally, literally lost it. I just could not fathom. I'm like, oh, they're so cute. So Aelin basically uses her fire and her power, whatever's left of it, to drag them from that unconsciousness 
and to bring them back. And so she and Rowan bind their magic and they just blast Maeve. Oh, thank God for Fenris and I feel so bad for him and he does this all because Maeve forced his twin to kill himself. But he ends up using his power that he hasn't been able to use since his twin died to go around Maeve and then stab her with the sword and then Aelin is able to slip the Silva's ring onto Maeve and it basically destroys her. And it was one of, it was the hands down best scene of the entire series. Who else am I forgetting? Oh, Dorian. He has changed so much from book one. Book one, he was this arrogant, swaggering womanizer. Book three, he, to me at least, was this puppy who had just had the love of his life, who literally had been in his life for like, what, two months, not even, taken from him who he still thinks about to this day in this book, which I don't understand, to this prince without a throne with this raw magic he couldn't control, to all of a sudden this crazy godlike person in this book. And then in the end when he, you know, was talking to Manon and Manon was gonna go back to the wastes and Irene was like, oh Jesus, just marry already. And Manon was like, we'll see. I'm like, this is so cute, they need, they need to get together. I love them so, so much. Speaking of Manon, the curse that was placed on them during the Croak and Iron Teeth War has been removed because by sacrificing themselves, the 13, or the 12 of the 13, melted iron, or iron teeth. Something else happened and something else happens that was part of the curse and now the land is blooming with flowers and they can go back home. They can go back home and Ansel is willing to give them a piece of the wasteland and recognize the old witch borders and I'm just, I'm so happy for her. I know these aren't real people, but I'm just so happy for them. <laughs> Sartak and Nezrin are gonna go back to the southern lands. They they gonna they gonna do it. They gonna get together. She's gonna be Empress and it's gonna be great. Lysandra and Adian, oh my god, how the hell could I forget about them? And Evangeline, oh Evangeline. You all know how much I love Adian. I can't express to you how much I love Adian, and I don't know why I love Adian. I think I loved him more so in Air of Fire when we first met him, because he had been holding out this hope and had been so loyal to Aelin even when she didn't even really know or want to come to terms with who she was. He had done all this planning and this conniving and had been, you know, captured and enslaved for a little bit and was still so believing in her. But he and Lysandra, oh my god. I've been rooting for them since I knew that they were going to be a couple, since I knew that she was a love interest for him and he for her. And they're gonna be married! They're gonna be married! And I'm so happy for them. My camera is flashing at me that it is about to die. And the one couple that I have yet to get to really is Aelin and Rowan, which actually leaves this as like a perfect kind of like stop for now. So I'm gonna get my camera charged up and then tomorrow when I'm better, I am going to go through what I think of Aelin and Rowan and what's happening with them. And so we're gonna end this on a really good note. Until tomorrow, everybody. All right, so it's currently 11.37 in the morning. Let's talk about Rowan and Aelin. They have been through quite a wild journey in these books. I went from absolutely hating them together to actually, as much as I hate to admit it, really liking them together. You know, moments still creep me out a little bit that he's so much older than her, but I love Lorcan and Elide so much, and yet he's even older than Rowan and she's younger than Aelin. You know, I'm just gonna like give into it. I like them, I like them together. This is a good thing, I'm happy for them, and we're just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> the part where Aelin is sealing the weird gate and Rowan had inked the weird mark tattoos on her back without her really knowing. I think it was like the turning point for me in like really actually liking their relationship. So um, for all of you people who have been watching these book talks since I made Air of Fire and I said that I absolutely hated them together, you were right. You go. And then the other part that really, really had me was that very last end part where in the epilogue where it's been a few months have passed you know they're getting ready for Adian and Lysandra's wedding you know Aelin wakes up at dawn and she walks out under her balcony and you know she wakes Rowan up and they look out and just spread 
all across Terrasen is King's Flame, which if you know from the books, it only appears, I think, when there's like a true a, a true leader or a true ruler or something happens. And uh, the last one that appeared was like a decade ago during Orlin's rule. It like just, it, it made me break down. That was the second part that made me cry. The first part was when, you know, the OG trio, the Kale, Dorian, and Aelin, the people who started this whole series, got together and they said their goodbyes. That moment when the King's Flame just spread across Terrasen after everything that she's had to go through and these to see that I finally just like I broke down something that I would really love to see in the future like I don't know if she's ever gonna build upon this world anymore but if she ever decided to do anything with this I would love to see a, like more about just Kale and Irene and their family I don't know their unit you know Kale Irene Irene's child that hasn't been born yet, even Dorian, like their unit is just so interesting to me and I loved all of those chapters and I would just love to see that. I don't know why. Like I was not expecting to like Tower of Dawn as much as I did and going into this book knowing that Kale and Irene's chapters were like some of my favorite, it was just so weird to think about because I loved Kale and then I hated Kale and now I love him again. Even just like short stories or just anything I would just love to see. Even with Nezrin and Sartak, you know, we have so much about Aelin and Rowan, so much about, you know, the Fae and these people. I would just love to see more about the Kaganite and about Nezrin and Sartak and about the Tori Sesme and just more stuff from Tower of Dawn. I would love to see that basically is what I'm saying. So I think the last thing that I want to end on is actually a little like tidbit that um, Ashley from Ashley Outpage told me last night that a viewer told her because she hadn't known it before. Something that really ties all of this series together is that Kingdom of Ash and Throne of Glass actually end with the same exact line. And I will read those to you now if you don't know. <laughs> Throne of Glass, the book that started it all. Selena had just won the competition, she became the king's champion, and Kale and her are talking. So he goes, Selena Sargathian, the king's champion. What about it? I like the sound of it, he said, shrugging. Do you want to know what your first mission will be? She looked at his golden brown eyes and all of the promises that lay within them and linked her arm with his as she smiled. Tell me tomorrow. And now, Kingdom of Ash that I'm holding upside down. <laughs> Rowan followed her as he had his entire life long before they had ever met, before their souls had sparked into existence. To whatever end, Fireheart. He glanced sidelong at her. Can I give you a suggestion for what we should rebuild first? Aelin smiled and eternity opened before them, shining and glorious and lovely. Tell me tomorrow. Oh, I love that so much. Okay. So on that note, that wonderful, glorious, shiny, lovely, whatever the hell she just said at the end of that note, I think it is time to finally end this vlog. I don't know how long this is going to be. I, most of this vlog is just me in my bed in the same shirt, but I hope you guys have enjoyed and I hope you guys liked the way that Kingdom of Ash ended. Let me know if you were to pick one character or one couple or one group or whoever in this story that you would want to see more of, who would that be? What did you like? What did you not like? What did I not touch on? I don't know, just anything down below. Now that I finished it, there's no way you can spoil me. So I'll actually read the comments this time. And I think that's everything that I wanna say. Thank you guys so much for watching. I am sad that this series is over, but I'm happy that everything ended okay <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching and i will catch you later goodbye